Working on cars is a tough gig. All it can take is one stripped bolt and that simple task you originally set out to complete becomes a nightmare. These days, we're pretty conditioned when it comes to wacky engine swaps thanks to the power of the internet. From LS1 converted R32 Skylines to V12 powered Land Cruisers, if you can dream it, then chances are someone's done it. What the internet doesn't show you is the hundreds of man hours spent between you and your mates piecing that dream together. The internet doesn't show you all the cuts and bruises on your fingers and knuckles. No one will ever tell you how many times they lost their temper looking for that 10mm socket, or how many nights they spent wide awake brainstorming how they're going to fit such a massive turbo in such a small engine bay. Taking on a build, whether it be an engine conversion or paint job, is a huge commitment. And if you've ever completed a project from start to finish, then just stop and give yourself a high five because it's not easy. This is a project that I've dreamed about for over 5 years and slowly I've collected the parts to build myself an elite street sleeper. After restoring the body and getting the crown on the road, it eventually came time to remove the ever reliable yet disappointing 1G GZE and make room for something with a bit more horsepower. The logical solution would be to keep it Toyota and head down the path of installing a JZ, but this is the internet we're talking about, and JZ swaps are only good for VR Commodores. Got the old 1G and A340 out of the crown, ready to throw on Marketplace. These were such a common engine to convert back in the day in Corollas, Celicas, uh, Supras, what else, what else do people put them in now? Everything. So, great engines, and they were very common. Another thing that was common for conversions was the supercharger. These were retrofitted onto so many different engines and still to this day you see them fitted to so many different cars. I think they made about three pound on a 3.8 um, oh, Commodore engine. Of course, yeah. It was yeah. like not even worth the purchase price. You know what fixes that? Barra and G40. Just been running the tape over both the 1G and the Barra, just getting a bit of a, a comparison in size and height and where everything's laid out. Uh, the Barra is obviously much bigger than the, the 1G. It's a fairly small six cylinder, but and the Barra is a very large six cylinder. But uh, there was a lot of room in this engine bay around the 1G. Probably our biggest hurdle is the track rod on steering. So. We know that, so what we're going to do is knock it off and just and let it drop down and get it out of the way. It's going to it's going to be it's going to have to go into where the sump is, but the only way to find out where to cut the sump is to put the engine in and then just lift it up and go. Yep, draw a line, start chopping. Uh, sway bar might be an issue, but we'll get to that when we get to it. We'll start by dropping the engine in and see how we go. I think Ross do dry sumps for these, you should be right. Dry sump now, you say? No need a heater or a firewall. <laughs> How about we just put a JZ in this there? This is just pretty, pretty standard. <laughs> We're no strangers to engine swaps, but they always have their challenges. There is a process you have to go through and that can be tedious, engine in and out multiple times, make clearances to suit, etc. We've done that, it's taken a day or so to do it. Uh, the main aspects of, of uh, fitting the engine in the car is uh, making sure that everything is clearance wise. So you do have to test fit your inlet manifold, your exhaust manifold, etc. Uh, we've had to make some modifications to the cross member to clear the front of the engine. This has got a specific weird little lump in the front of the engine that's a barra thing. Um, we have also modified the actual bell housing by uh, taking a bunch of material off the, the bolt holes 
We've milled them down to suit. We've clearanced the actual tunnel uh, around the entry of the bell housing because it's a lot bigger than the, the engine that was in it. We knew we had to do that. No big deal. They're pretty malleable. Just uh, a bit of careful measuring and, and uh, beating with a hammer. We are now sort of ready to mount the engine. One of the weird things about barras is the cylinder head isn't in the middle of the engine. They've kind of added a, an inlet cam and it's offset a bit. So that can be a bit of a trap if you're trying to chase the center line of the engine. Now we're sort of, everything's chocked up. The gearbox is strapped up. It's ready to go. We will start building the engine mounts. We are using a Tough Mounts universal kit for this. So as you're going, you see that's not quite level, but as we go through it, we will start at one side and then level it out when we do the second mount. And then everything should be good to go. We've checked radiator clearance, even though it's got a big fat radiator in it, it still fits. So we're, it's, it's looking pretty good. Can be challenging, but you've got to work through it. Rodjo Madodjo, what do you think of the barrack conversion, mate? He's, he's, he's not convinced. Crowns are kind of unique. They have a centralised sump with a cross member at the front and the steering at the rear. So in this case, we've got the choice of two sumps with a barra. We've got a front sump on the BA to BF and the later FG engine, which this one is, is a rear sump. We pulled the sump off. We did try and mark it when it was, when the sump was on there, but you couldn't really get this steering back up into the position so, to accurately do it. So we've pulled the sump off. We're making some marks on the engine itself where the steering path goes. As it goes through an arc, it starts forward and then pulls backwards as the steering turns like this. We've marked the position of the steering on the windage tray here uh, and we'll pull the engine back out and then we'll transfer those markings over onto the actual sump itself. Cut a slice through it. We've got some 75 mil alley box that will turn into a C channel and then we'll clean it all up and weld it in there. Welding your barra sump can be difficult due to warpage. So I've come and seen my mate Klopfi from RK Garage. You've got a couple of barras laying around. So because we've cut out quite a large section of the sump, we've had it bolted down to a block that's to keep it flat and secure. And we've given it a preheat and Cloppy's gonna fire up the TIG and blast away. Hopefully not. Yeah. Do you have any warranty on this, mate? Or what's the go? If it, what, if, what if it warps or leaks? <laughs> I <hate> garage warranty. <laughs> There's a sump all welded up, just letting it cool down while it's still bolted to the block. These dash 12 ports are for a transfer tube too, just so there's no dead oil sitting in the back. So that's all done. Shout out to Klopfi at RK Garage. I'm gonna link his Instagram in the description if you're after a quick welding job or possibly if you wanna turbo LS swap your Mitsubishi Pajero. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a call. Thanks, Klopp. We appreciate it, man. No Imagine. worries, mate. Anytime. Cheers, dude.
Did you buy this from Golby's? Um, I may have gotten a mad deal somewhere else. Mm, mad deal. What's that? No. You're hoaxing, eh? So now we're up to the bits where we bolt on the shiny stuff and stare at it, take some Instagram photos. On this side of the engine, we've got this, I don't even know if it has a name, let's call it a TSF plenum. We uh, designed these and my friend Denny makes them. Uh, this particular one is a bit different from the ones that are uh, normally sold in that it has a different flange on it to suit a very large 82 mil throttle body that comes from Raceworks, that's a Bosch one. These are primarily designed for BA, BF Falcons. They fit on the lower runners of, of that particular manifold. They also fit EF to AU single overhead cam engines as well. And we have actually fitted one of these to a, a Barra powered XE Falcon that has the big strut towers on it. So it does have a little divot there built into the casting to suit that. You can buy these on the store at theskidfactory.com. On the other side there, you'll spot a very, very nice new shiny turbo. Uh, we swapped out the alternator that was in the box for the proper unit. That is a Garrett G40 1150. Turbo technology has come in leaps and bounds in the last decade or so. I've been there, I've seen it happen, and you know I'm into turbos, so I've taken notice. Uh, this turbo here was originally fitted to Woody's 1UZ about 10 years ago. It is a GT4094. At the time it was the new turbo and it was a pretty good thing. This one here is what we're going to fit to the Barra in the Crown Wagon. It is a G40 1150 so this is a pretty new one itself. The biggest difference I think you'll find with these things is the material they use in the actual turbine itself and the shaft has changed quite a bit. Uh, I'm not sure what this one's made out of but you can see there's a very different blade shape and thickness of the blade. Strengthening the material that they're making the blade out of allows them to thin it out which allows for more gas flow but they can still get the drive they need with the, with the angles of the blade so you end up with a turbine that, that's got the amount of drive it needs to drive the compressor but it also allows the engine to breathe and that is very important. As you can see we've got a billet compressor wheel on the G40, that's been a thing for quite a while now. This turbine housing that we've got on is a 119, which is I think the biggest one that they, they offer. T4, twin entry. The old GT40 is the same. Uh, that's a good choice for a, a large engine like this that has an automatic transmission with a good converter where lag is just not a thing. As soon as you stomp the pedal, it's going to come up into the zone where it's going to work. I'm really keen to see how this goes. We know they work well on a lot of other engines, but I haven't heard of too many being used on barrows at this stage, so it's gonna be cool to see what it does. Controlling all of the hudushas is a Go Fast Bits EX50 wastegate. This is gonna go off the manifold here. We need to make a slight change as the steering box is in the way. So we need to, got to put some steam pipe on there to extend that up. But before we do that, we need to start on the dump pipe because this is also on the way. So three and a half inch stainless is going to be going down here before merging into some oval pipe. Plummet to the atmosphere? No, plummet back into the exhaust. Yeah, plummet to atmosphere. No, like plummet back into the dump pipe. Yeah, but it all goes to the same place. And then it goes to the atmosphere at the back. Um, I will be changing into some oval pipe down the bottom there. So just making a dump down to a V-band then we can transi transition into the oval part. So let's hook in, get it done. Twenty nine psi minimum spring. Minimum. Yep. <laughs> Someone's got to jump under and line it up. That's you.
It's like the same frequency as an idling SR20. That's the hot side all done. We've modified the existing uh, exhaust manifold to take the EX50 wastegate in a different position just so it fitted in the car. We've also fabricated this um, dump pipe and we've got it returned to the dump instead of to atmosphere, which is unusual. And uh, I demonstrated nicely to Woody why I don't like doing it because it takes ages. As all ready to go back on the engine in the car and we'll, we'll load the turbo cartridge back into it and we're going to move on to the intercooler and intercooler piping side of things. Cooling system wise, we've retained the MA70 alloy radiator which we previously fitted when it was 1GGZD. We have to do some modifications to the upper and lower tank outlets to accommodate for the 38mm hoses. That's no, that's no biggie, that's easy to do. Further forward is the AC condenser. I contacted the crew at Noosa Radiators and I gave Luke the dimensions. I said, this is the size of it. I also would like to have the receiver drive built in and I want both outlets on one side. Luke did some research and funnily enough, an FG Falcon one was actually well suited for the application. That gives us a lot more room for the intercooler core. Our mate Dave from FFM has saved the day. Dave does a bunch of quality work. He mainly specializes in airboxes. He did a airbox for Owls Cummins Power Patrol. He said he's had this core on the shelf. This is a 635 by 295 by 90 mil thick. And we've also had these custom tanks designed for us. So Dave spent the morning drawing these up in Fusion 360. We've even engraved our Skid Factory logo on there, which is pretty cool. We then use his massive big pan brake folded them up and Dave's tacked them to now give us this not finished product because now we've got to weld it on, onto the intercooler. I did ask Dave to put his FFM logo on there, but he said he didn't want to put his name to my crappy weld. So we've got to get these tanks welded on the core. Then we've got to mount the core. Above that, I do want to mount a transmission cooler, but until we get the intercooler in there, we don't know where it's going to go. We've got a bunch of Raceworks clamshell clamps to retain the boost and then it feeds up into our Bosch 82mm throttle body. So let's get some mounting and get to some welding, get the job done. Get to some mountain. Get to some mountain, did that sound weird, did it? Yeah, let's get to some mountain. <laughs> Intercool is all mounted up, ready to go. We're gonna now move on to some pipe work. Uh, the custom end tanks and sort of making it all ourselves is obviously the downside to that is it's very time consuming, particularly the welding part of the stuff. So 
Um, if you can get away with a bolt-on one, then it's always a good idea. On the top here, we've got a um, RX-7 oil cooler. Uh, we use one of those on Gav's Hakasuka as an engine oil cooler, but we're actually using it on this car as a transmission cooler. Uh, this thing is way too low and Woody refuses to make it higher, so we're going to take the, the, the deep pan off the trans and put a, a normal pan on it. Downside to that is obviously you lose oil capacity, so we're going to pick up oil capacity and cooling by adding this cooler on here. We've got a step up from two and a half into three on the turbo side. That's going to go down through the uh, hole in the guard, straight into the cooler. On this side, same thing, three inch up, up into here, and we're going to step up into three and a half inch into the throttle body. So hopefully we'll be able to make those pipes singularly and not have to put joiners in the middle. It's just, it's just neater that way. All you got to do is make sure that you can actually put the pipe back in there once you've got your whatever shape it is. So let's uh, get stuck into that and hope for the best. Hey! <laughs> That intercooler is crooked, yo. It's not, because I put a level on it. No, it's, I can see it's crooked from here. It's your car that's crooked. I am far from a qualified fabricator, nor do I have the experience of Alan, but I am very stoked with how this turned out. It's very rewarding to do the job myself, seeing as this is my own car. Even though everyone's gonna give me crap about my bird poop welds, and it's definitely not up to FFM uh, standards, but I think we did a pretty good job on the intercooler. I have mounted a coolant overflow and also a washer bottle. These are a Raceworks 50 mil diameter tube, which one of them houses a washer motor on the bottom. The other one's for coolant overflow. I have made up some power steering lines and some trans cooler lines. That's all done, and now we're going to move on to the fuel system. We've got a surge tank we want to mount in the back. Raceworks also have a new billet fuel rail for the barra. So we're gonna bolt that one on. We've got some 1500cc injectors and we're gonna plumb it all using some Raceworks AN lines. So let's head up to the back of the car and talk about fuel pumps and surge tanks. Woody's actually replaced the pump on this uh, when he got the car back on the road because the, the original one was ancient and and was weak, so it's actually got a Peerberg uh, screw pump on it at the moment. Uh, what we're gonna have to do though is fit a surge tank and put a couple more pumps on it because it's obviously gonna have uh, you know, 800 horsepower or something like that. Uh, we are gonna move the pump, it's up, up in here, um, but it's gonna have to be moved because there's gonna be a very large nine inch diff swinging up and down there that's, that's gonna need a lot more space. So we're gonna retain that pump and use it to fill a surge tank. So there's heaps of different designs of surge tank. This is a Raceworks one. Woody's already cut off the original brackets because they're not suitable. And we're gonna, we're obviously gonna modify it a bit from its, from this, but uh, that's gonna go up inside there. And it's gonna have a couple of pumps coming out of here. We're gonna use um, the same pump as we're using to fill it, a couple of Peerberg 800s. They're a really nice, uh, quiet pump. And they uh, put out a lot of fuel, so. It's a, it's a good thing for, so you don't have the buzzing noises of, of a, say, a Bosch 044 or whatever. Now we're going to work on mounting that up in there and move on to the plumbing and that sort of thing. We're using AN lines all, all the way through the fuel system and the problem with that is it's kind of like a bit of an addiction where you start using it and then you've got to use it everywhere. What we did is I tacked them on there first with the TIG and then we went in to see Luke Adner's radiators to uh, silver solder these on and uh, we ended up doing it ourselves because they're all busy but anyway it's not, that, it's not that hard but sometimes you need to modify stuff to convert 
older systems like this over to AN. So it's all doable. You just got to think outside the square. Use your brain, as they'd say. That's the other thing that some people say. Pretty well done with the fuel system plumbing. I'm really stoked with how the surge tank setup came out. I had this vision from the beginning of, okay, I've got 150 mil in between the rail and the body, and the surge tank was 150 mil wide, and ended up just bolting up in there and worked really well. We've then got the uh, feed pump for the surge right next to it, and that's also got a 100 micron filter before it because the old crusty tank in here was still showing some signs of corrosion, so that's gonna filter out any schmutz to supply in those pumps. For space reasons, I've also relocated the charcoal canister to the rear of the car in the inner guard. That's just purely because I didn't want to have it up in the engine bay here. It's just too bulky and gets in the way of everything else. Well, Woody's been fiddling around with frivolities like air conditioning and stuff that you don't need. Uh, I've been starting the, the wiring process. Uh, we are using Haltech products as usual. Um, they've now got this R3, which is the little brother. Uh, that's still a PDM and ECU built into one, but it has a, it's got less out inputs and outputs, obviously, because it's got less plugs on it. Well, we're also using a PD16. This is a power distribution module uh, in itself. That goes in the rear of the car. We're going to use that to power up things like the fuel pumps, uh, the trans brake, and we're also going to use its extra ins and outs to take information from the sensors on the transmission back to this unit and then they will be relayed forward via the CAN cable to the main unit, the R3. Is there enough outputs for my pie warmer in the back? No. I made sure I used them all up because I knew you'd want to do something silly. Yeah, well, what, what about an you, inverter? You want what a fuel a pump or a pie warmer? 240 volt inverter so then I can run a microwave. What sort of battery are you going to put in it? And how many alternators? We can get rid of the aircon unit and put another alternator there if you yeah. want. <laughs> I won't be installing a coffee machine, but I am installing a dual battery system. Why do I need a dual battery system? Well, if you come over here, you'll see that I've installed a fridge over here, complete with lemon squash. This is an XTM 12 litre fridge. I had this plan in my head for so long, like having the surge tank down there. I did a quick measure up and went, sweet, a fridge will fit there. I've actually, I've pulled it apart. I've definitely voided warranty with the fridge, but don't worry about that. 
I've pulled the plastics off it. I'm gonna to have to wire it into the battery. So battery wise, dual battery. This here is a DIN 53. This is a crank battery, powers the Nexus R3 and the PD16. Then I am also using a lithium battery. So super cheap auto, I've got a massive range of batteries and new to the range is the this bad boy here, power lithium. The battery I'm using, which is mounted just on the floor down here, is a 135 amp hour battery. It's massive for what I want to do with it. I've also got a DC to DC charger for the lithium battery, and then got to run cables for the fridge. Everything's still in shambles. There's wires everywhere. The seats are out, carpets are up, because we're not quite there yet. We're still waiting on a bulkhead. We're still waiting on a few connectors. So we're, we're going to get there eventually, but not quite yet. So you might laugh at the fridge, but when we're at the track and I'm the one with lemon squash in my fridge, then you'd be like, yo, hey, Woody. <laughs> you mean when I'm in the back? Yeah, well, when you're in the back and we're racing people. Doing 140 down the back track. <laughs> It'll all be that, worth that's it. That's what I was envisaging. I did try to in, uh, put an inverter somewhere too, but there's not enough room and that is going a bit far. But the plan is I can go to the track. I've got USB ports so I can charge GoPros, charge cameras, and I can also drink lemon squash responsibly while I'm there. All right, Barrows. I've done a couple of builds in the past. One of them being Millsy's Bedford. The other engine we built was for Wayne's XE Falcon Wagon. The other option is to start with an FG turbo engine. These are getting a bit hard to come by these days though. So this engine, uh, I paid $3,000 for this from ACM parts like five years ago. So that's why we got it. And it's just sat on the shelf awaiting the moment now where we can hook in and do all the good stuff to it. For those of you who aren't familiar, from BF2 onwards, all the turbo variants had stronger rods, and these engines are well capable of making eight, 900 horsepower from standard bottom ends, but they can't do it from dead stock. You do need to do a few upgrades. So we got onto the blokes at Golby's Parts, and they have delivered us a care package. What you're gonna need to do to your FG turbo engine is a few things. Oil pump gears, the standard gears in these are sintered metal and they will shatter when they're under high load and it's a known failure, it will destroy your engine. So oil pump gears, I've also got a backing plate, I haven't gone for the whole, whole oil pump. The other thing that will set you back is valve springs. Kelford cams have got valve springs available. I've also opted for a set of cams because the FG engines do suffer from pitting uh, in the valve train in the cam lobes. More power means higher cylinder pressures. So to keep the head on, we've got some 12 mil tool steel head studs. They're also from Golby's Parts. I've also got a timing chain kit. And then right at the front of the engine, we have got our Ross Performance Parts Gold Series Balancer. That one's getting thrown on there because these engines can suffer from a harmonic balancer failure and it's a bad time if that happens. So because I'm making a bit more power from standard, I do want to throw that on the front there to keep everything on there, keep the vibrations at a minimum. So that's all we're going to do today. We've got it on the engine stand. We just, we put the turbo on the inlet manifold on there so it looks good for a thumbnail, but we've got to rip all this stuff off, get the head off. We're going to get the head serviced. I might look in the bottom end, check some mains, check some big ends. I don't know if I should just leave it the luck, <laughs> lucky wrecker engine and don't check it, but we'll get, we'll, we'll, once we get down there, we'll see how it goes. Looks pretty fresh, eh? Looks alright. I don't know why we didn't pull the valve cover off five years ago. <laughs> or maybe we did, I just can't remember. Did we? I don't think we did. Yeah, I don't remember that. Well, you might have because this is broken.
I've got the cylinder head back from the machine shop, nothing crazy of a job, basic service and a skim. We've also replaced the valve springs and retainers with a set from Kelford Cams. We are replacing the cams too with a set from Kelford Cams. These are a set of 218B cams, 280 degree duration. The standard barrack cams are known for like cam, the, the lobe wear, pitting. I'm not too sure if that's an FG thing specifically or if it was throughout the whole range, but we weren't too sure. This engine's been sitting up on a pallet. We didn't pull the valve cover off. I assumed that it had high Ks. I assumed that they were going to be buggered, which is why we've got a set. The other advantage to Kelford cams is that they make power way more efficiently with a set of cams in them compared to the standard lift. So that's definitely a plus. We're about to chuck the cylinder head on, but we have to clean up the deck surface first. As you saw when we pulled this off, there was carbon and crap everywhere. It was evidence of number six being blown out too. So to do this, we're gonna use a knife stone. We've done this before on a few engines too. We've got two here. Which one's the better one, Alan? Which one's newer? We've done this in a few engines. Basically, knife stones are flat surface and coarse, so we can rub this down on the deck surface to clean it off. Hopefully it'll hold it. That one time you go to film something and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's an easy out, they never work. Easy out to shit. The end. Don't be ham fisted with your barrel valve cover. It makes me angry. Remember when people used to hang chains off their wallets in their pockets? You could put that around your neck. Not chains this big, surely. What's your rap name? Put it around your neck and give me a gang sign. <laughs> it's the big clock at the bottom. <laughs> MC who? MC Motronic 36 minus one. <laughs> Enter the chamber. <laughs> Maybe that's what they were talking about. <laughs> Can 
I haven't actually done a barrow chain before. It's a little bit different. I've just got a tooth out. Always double check those tunnel marks, Alan. The last piece of the timing chain puzzle is the tensioner. Uh, now these things can fail and they're much more likely to fail if they're not a genuine part so the recommendation is to use, just use a genuine Ford tensioner because they're the most reliable. Jeez, how much sealant do you want to use brass? Some rookie made it. <laughs> Hash job of this I tell you. <laughs> The old Alan would have just used the bolt to screw it on. The Alan that doesn't have one of these tools would do that, yeah. Except the bolt wouldn't reach, so just be hammering it on with a bit of wood. We did that with Dave's car, didn't we? Huh? I remember we didn't film it because we were ashamed of doing it. What? <laughs> Dave's um, VK and this big sledge and a big chunk of wood. Probably. Just look at it! I reckon that's a sick colour. Thousands would disagree. <laughs> <coughs> if you ever need a workbench in a hurry, just grab yourself a wheelie bin and you're on your way. Got to give a shout out to Ryan for powder coating these parts for us. He smashed it out. This looks so good. These are our uh, inlet manifold toppers, which suit a BA lower manifold. This one has got a Bosch e-throttle adapter welded on top of it. If you're on the fence about using e-throttle on your car and you have the ECU capabilities, definitely jump on board. It takes care of idle control. You can do fun stuff like cruise control, traction control, all that stuff. So get on board. One thing to take away from uh, working on this engine in this episode is a very simple engine. It's pretty easy, for a modern engine, it's very easy to work on. There's not many things you can get wrong. The camshafts are easy to change. Very simple timing chain system. And the rest of it's just a, a, a very well matured engine from the 60s, I think. I might get some hate for that, but this is pretty much a direct descendant of a 1960s Falcon engine, so. They did well keeping it going and it's a, it's a fantastic engine. The reason why it's so popular is because it's cheap and, and a very efficient thing considering how simple it is. A beautiful lump of horsepower deserves a beautiful engine bay and the Crown currently isn't in that state. A few jobs which I've ticked off off camera was brake lines, stainless brake lines from the master cylinder down to both the front and the rear line which goes to the back of the car. I then Stripped the whole engine bay, got everything out and started on the chassis. The chassis had just little minor marks of rust where the welds are. It's, an old, it's old, it's never been treated before. So stripped everything back as best I could, hit it with some rust converter and then bombed it in some gloss black. That actually turned out really nice. That's set overnight and I'm back today to hook in to do the engine bay. Got a lot of work to do, sand all this back get it painted in body colour and then the beautiful barra can be bolted back in for good and hopefully never come back out, well not for a long time anyway, until I throw a rod because I make too much horsepower for the stock bottom end of the FG turbo engine. Right on, let's hook in. This legend rocks up to save the day, Maxi. Get the, get the dog. <laughs> get it. Get the dog.
Painting is a skill that I definitely haven't mastered yet, but nonetheless, the engine bay is one color and it matches the body, so I'm pretty stoked on that. This is my first time doing a three-stage paint job, so base coat goes down, uh, pearl coat goes down, and then the clear coat over the top. Um, I did stuff up a few things, I did rush it, so there's a couple of runs there, but that's what happens when it's a Friday afternoon and you need to get the job done. I've got to say a mad shout out to Josh at Custom Paints and Industrial. Gave me so much advice and hooked me up with some good price on the paint. So if you're on the coast and you need some paint stuff, definitely go and see him. Now we're at the stage where everything can get bolted back in. Brake booster, brake lines, you can then swing the engine in and button this thing up. And hopefully once we're done that, we can finish off the wiring and hit the key, maybe. I'm getting hopeful, but we'll see how we go, fingers crossed. Yeah, that pins it lining up to the, the mount on my side. It's a lot easier without that heater box in there, the blower motor box. Got the transmission back from Mark after a bit of a refresh. He did rebuild it uh, many years ago, but we just wanted to go through it and make sure it wasn't corroded or anything on the inside. And he did say that there was a couple of new parts that he likes to use in them for this sort of basic build. Turbo 400s are excellent for a street uh, transmission for something that's got like 900 to 1000 horsepower because they're already very strong. The internals on them don't really need to be replaced, so to speak. The, the, the hard parts are pretty good. All that's been done to this is basic like control stuff, like it's got a billet valve body and it's got a few strengthening parts around the place that are just known issues. We've put a few sensors on it. Um, we've got the Haltech linear position sensor here. That's going to basically indicate your shift position. Uh, that's very handy for a few reasons. It goes straight into the ECU, uh, which gives it the position of the transmission. Then it can display that on your Haltech dash. Uh, it also can be used for control things such as uh, boost by gear, like power by gear, that sort of thing. And also just simple things like the ECU controls the starter motor and it won't start if it's in not in park or neutral. So very flexible uh, ECU that still needs some input sensors like this for to be able to um, control things. The other things we've got are just basic pressure and temperature sensors. Uh, and also obviously the trans brake solenoid on this side, that's all wired into the wiring that goes to the rear of the car to the PD16. Uh, this has got an aftermarket bell housing and this converter made by Hughes is made to suit this bell housing. So your depths and all that sort of thing have been uh, documented and worked out by Hughes. So you can buy this, this converter uh, straight from them to suit the bell housing if you give them the part number of the bell housing that you're using. Uh, that's a it's around about the three and a half to four thousand rpm stall speed so pretty perfect for a barrow with a turbo this size on it uh, one big problem with barrows and automatic transmissions is the flex plate likes to fall off the engine first of all me personally i wouldn't use a factory flex plate they're too thin and they basically flex which is in the name uh, you can also use aftermarket bolts like these arp uh, the other thing you've got to do is if this is painted or powder coated, you've got to take that off because it might be tight when you do it up, but when, when it's rubbing around and vibrating and heating up and cooling down, that paint will then disperse and then your bolt is not actually done up properly. So every surface that's got a bolt or a crankshaft or a torque converter touching it, you've got to clear that back to bare metal. Uh, obvious last thing is, is Loctite, but this isn't magic. It won't stop that bolt coming undone. 
So do, do what you can to reduce it, and you just have to check them all the time as well, which is obviously not easy to check these bolts, but you can check your converter bolts regularly and you'll have a, a much better time because when they do fall off, it's not a fun time at all. I knew that would happen too. I was sick of it falling on the ground. As the saying goes, the last 5% of your project takes the longest and the crown's been no different. We've spent the last close to two weeks just buttoning everything up, finishing everything off to get to this stage now where the ECU is hooked up and Al is doing some configuration. As I've gone along, I've, I've, done, I've changed a few things, um, done a bit more heat management over it on the master cylinder side over here, so added a Raceworks turbo beanie and made up a heat shield um, using the car builder's aluminium sheet. That's to protect the brake master cylinder and the booster just from heat from the exhaust. Also, everything's been bolted on, painted, and we are now ready to almost hit the key. There's still a lot of stuff like um, the pedal inside the car hasn't been mounted. There's still lots of interior pieces everywhere. Um, the dash nor the keypad hasn't been mounted yet, but that's jobs for once we can get the car out and get the doors open, I want to be able to get in the car comfortably. So that was doing the ones and zeros. You're going to say we're ready to hit the key, no? No, we're not. Damn it. <laughs> we're getting close though. Oh yeah, it's hot. Leave those fans on. My bad. Did you reset the ECU? Is that, is that what you did? No, I just pressed a thousand percent instead of a, oh. a ten. <laughs> Alright, good to go again? Got the engine started a little bit prematurely but we wanted to get that done just in case there are any problems we had a power steering leak but i was worried about stuff like one the radiator we put a lot of welding into that and the sump the sumps can be a bit temperamental when you weld them but it's all good there's no leaks fingers crossed it stays like that we are going to put a nine inch in the car we were going to put a, a g series diff from a hilux in there but being that the weight of the car and what i want to do with it a nine inch is the best option when it comes to gear ratios and strength. So we're gonna put the car up in the air. We've got our mate Matt Rogan from Rogan Industries around to give us a hand. We're gonna talk you through what we're gonna do. So as I said, nine inch. Uh, we've done nine inch conversions before, but today is a little bit different because we're gonna be using some floating hubs, which is overkill for the Crown, but it's something we haven't done before and I don't mind having a bit of overkill anyway. So Matt, talk us through the process. Where do we start? What do we do? Basically, we wanted to have in it factory like a three link. We're going to put a four link in it, no panard bar, uh, triangulated. And we're just going to make it up as we go, as we usually do. And um, we'll see how we end up in the end, but it should be good. Al's already removed the diff and the fuel tank to give us some room in here. So we're starting with a blank canvas and now we can hook in and get the job done. Two day job, you reckon? One day if we, you know, get into it. <laughs> no smoko. <laughs> no smoko for you. <laughs>
making heaps of progress. We've got the housing tacked in there with some brackets. Matt makes these brackets. They're just a laser cut generic falling kit. And we're at the stage now where we are mounting up the shocks. So we don't know what size the shocks can be. So Matt just uses some box alloy as to as to set a length. Um, but we've also got to make sure that there's going to be room for the spring and everything for the fuel tank, which I'm sure Matt's thinking about now. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're thinking about. That's like a good chassis gap. Probably go to there and then bring your wheel in a little bit more. Okay. Well, you're pushing mine further out. Yeah, I know. So, so we'll just undo that bolt and then you push yours back in. We've got the diff out of the car and on the bench. That's so we can finish off the brackets. And then after that, we can take it over to Matt's to throw it on the diff jig. But before we put it on the jig, we didn't know a width for the diff. So we've got the trailer axle in the car here with a set of wheels and we have the car down on the ground to check the clearance between the rail and the guard. This is a 235 60 15 mounted on a set of Outlaw drags. I've got bead locks. I did not need bead locks, but I wanted them just because everyone loves bead locks. So this is going to be my kind of racing wheel and also when I want to get power to the ground. I've also got a set of these. These are a Southern Ways Shadow 2, which Mark has built for me. A nine and a half inch width with a 14 millimeter offset. These are eights uh, with zero offset. So there is a size difference, which I'm making Matt deal with over here, but <laughs> we have got a center line marked on the axle and now we can get a width here. Yep. Sweet. Strip it down, cut the housing down, we'll probably put the floater hubs in, put the housing back in the car, check brake caliper clearance. We probably need to clock that around, see where it's gonna hit the rail. Yep and then we can, you know, pull it back out finally. Sweet. Weld her up, paint it, put it back in. Floater hubs fitted back onto the housing. That is to check to make sure that the diff width is okay to make sure Matt didn't cut it to the wrong length. And also to check the caliper clearance against the chassis rail. We've also thrown the third member in the center into the housing to get a tail shaft length. So we caught up the crew at GJ Driver Lines. They did us a shaft for Kevo and they are the go-to if you want a performance shaft. They do alloy, carbon, chrome alloy, whatever you want. Now it's all gonna come back out over to Matt's house to throw it on the jig where it can be bolted uh, to the jig, so when we weld it up, you can, can minimise warpage. Matt's got a big chromoly bar that goes through into the, through, through the axles, so it doesn't move. And that also makes sure that the diff is straight when you're welding it on, so you're not going to accidentally weld in some camber or toe into your diff. diff center I've got a hold of is a full spool and a full spool on the street isn't fun. Good for drag racing, great, ap great application for drag racing, but street car, I'm gonna drive the wheels off this thing. I do not want a full spool. So I have opted for an Eaton True Track. This one came from Harrop. This is a, I suppose the best way to put it would be a gear driven LSD. Um, great application for a street car, perfect for this. The nine inch is an overkill for the car. We've already been through that. This is a 35 spline center. Um, can handle way more power than I'm gonna make, but definitely a great addition to your street car. If you want a solid LSD just so you can spin two, leave some 11s down the road, this is what you're gonna need.
got legendary pro stock racer Dave Rogan here to help us today, mate. Thanks for your expertise. <laughs> oh, mate, I've got nothing better to do. Plus, <laughs> I've my car's been here, and I'm a bit I'm a bit worried about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm extremely worried about it, all right? But I'm saying nothing. I say nothing. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> I'm going with the flow. All right. Okay, Nick. Green's getting there, we'll wait till it. How many beeps have got to do? You watch it go red. 95, 97, twist the device. That's it. I reckon, I reckon that's good. That, that's nearly a full tooth of depth there. Looking all right, Davo? Oh, high performance, mate. High performance. Bella, wind the boost right up. <laughs> okay? Note to self, make sure there's a drain bung in there before you put oil in the diff. <laughs> Why wasn't there a drain bung for you to on? <laughs> the brakes on the back of the car are just an FG Falcon caliper and rotor. They work with the race products floater hub. And for the front, I've opted for a set of hopper stoppers. Hopper stoppers are an Australian owned and made company. They do brake kits for many, many, many vehicles. I've opted for the billet four pot caliper on the front. These wheels still fit under a 15 inch wheel. So I'm going to put them on the front. I've done a bit of a dummy assembling here. There is some modifications to do to the spindle and stuff, but hopper stoppers have sent out the instructions, which I read and made sure to follow. If you need a brake kit for your car, contact the crew at hopper stoppers and you can end up with a set of billet four pots on the front of your car, just like these ones. Don't even have to pack my own wheel bearings. Maxi comes and sands my engine bay and packs my wheel bearings. My man. Pay me, in, pay me in beer. Be taking note, Gussie, because you're going to have to do this on your patrol. Yeah, there's, a, there's a bearing left. Go get some gloves on. We've got a dyno book this week and the car still is not finished. We have been working through the list, ticking off those jobs. Some of them were the Haltech dash and keypad. That's now mounted up and the interior is back in the car. We've got a tail shaft. We're back on the ground. GJ drive lines hooked us up with a chrome alloy tail shaft. Bolted that up in there, all good. And the suspension has now been finished off. The front end consists of double adjustable Viking shocks from CRS. In the rear, I have got a set of strain shocks. The car's now back on the ground. We've gone through a few heat cycles now. And the last job to tick off, because we were waiting on the tail shaft, was the exhaust. So we've got a bunch of vibrant parts from Golby's. We've got some oval pipe, which I'm not too sure if we're gonna use. I, th I think Matt has like hand polished this muffler, which I don't know if that's an option when you're on the Golby's website to hand polished via Steady Fab or not, but um, it, they, it all looks really nice and I'm excited to get it up in there. TIG weld that all up and then scrape it all on the ground once it's, <laughs> once I go over a speed bump, so. 
Let's hook in. That's the last job ticked off the list for the cram wagon. Three and a half inch stainless steel all the way through. Golby sent us some oval tube and also some oval transitions to three and a half inch pipe. I then used that oval transition to go in between the cross member. So it actually, the pipe stays level at a height and it, and it bellows down. So, oh actually, uh, fuel pump guard. I also made up a little bash plate for the fuel pump. So there was a few comments in the, in the comment section saying what about the fuel pumps and a low road or something but that's all covered nothing can hit that now so I'm gonna drive it home I've already gone for a maiden voyage into town went to see my mates at Paddy's for a wheel alignment and Lukey Rooster at Noosa Radiators to gas the aircon and we are sorted icy cold aircon already got my priorities sorted so let's go down and see Kai at Night Family Motorsport get this bolted onto the dyno Thursday mornings at Night Family Motorsport hey Kai how are you Good, good. Where would you rather be, mate? I would, right now, <laughs> I mean, the beach is looking pretty nice. Oh, it is <laughs> so Kai, apart from the General Barra uh, G40 Turbo 409 inch, mm. talk us through uh, your dyno session today, what we're going to do and, and what's your expectations? So today, we're, yeah, we're going to start tuning on E10. Um, so Woody's got some nice cheap fuel to drive around in. Um, believe it or not, you don't need it a million horsepower in your street car to drive every day. Um, so we're going to have a, uh, we'll have an E10 tune that is actually economical and cheap to run. And then um, the great, beautiful thing, we're going to have a flex fuel sensor in the car so we can, uh, then we'll put some E85 in it and we'll tune it up on E85. So Woody's got the flexibility of whatever he wants, best of both worlds. Block out those awful barra noises. Oh, oh come oh, on, man. man. <laughs> it sounds good. It sounds a bit raspy. What? It sounds raspy. Hang on. Rat. Oh, yeah. It sounds good now. <laughs> <laughs> So we're finished with the E10 tune. Kai did wind it back a little bit to, I believe it was 490 horsepower. We ended up making it so on the screen, I'll we'll bring it up. Uh, purely because you said you did hear a bit of knock Yeah, events. I mean, we ran it a couple times up at 500, it was 520-ish on, on it. Um, but it was definitely, if you did successive pulls, it was it was right on the knock limit of the fuel. Yep. It's, um, we're already down well into the single digit timing numbers um, which then the issue with that is if you keep running it there with the timing so low the EGT is going to be quite high so the better 
the more sensible option is to back the boost off a little bit and then come back to somewhere where the fuel's a little happier. Yep, sweet. So that's exactly what we did. Um, and yeah, so 490, I think that's still a fairly respectable oh, number through a for an unlocked, you know, turbo 400, 9 yeah. and E10, like, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, sweet. So now we're stopping over to E85. On the topic of fuel, definitely bring enough fuel when you need to tune your vehicle. So assuming there'll be about 30 litres of E10, I've also got a spare 20 of E10 just in case we needed that. But now we're pumping into a spare Jerry, which I've brought, assuming we've got enough. Um, so 20 litre Jerry of E10. And I've also got 40 litres of E85 too. This car has been an absolute dream come true and wouldn't have been possible without the help of my legendary friends and epic companies that have contributed their time, knowledge and products to build what is in my eyes the ultimate street car. Now's about the time when I get philosophical and tell you that you don't need a big turbo and 600 horsepower to put a smile on your face. But I tell you what, it sure does help. I'm beyond stoked with the outcome of this wagon and truth be told, it's not finished. Let's be real, no project car is ever finished. I'm keen to drive the absolute wheels off this thing, so stay tuned. My name's Woody, this is The Skid Factory, and thanks for watching. Ahoy crew, thank you for watching right till the very end. Just want to say a massive thanks to all of our Patreon supporters and thank you to everyone who supports the show by buying our merchandise or even just liking, commenting and sharing our videos. It really does help with getting our videos seen by more people. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for some more epic content coming to you every week. Cheers, legends.